first of three series, or first of a series of three. Uh, this presentation, you will hear from Jen Gilbert Jenkins uh, about how to grow hemp and uh, I'll let that take. So, uh, just quickly, if you need the bathroom, go out this door here and there'll be green dots on the ground. Just follow the green dots downstairs and the bathroom will be over here. Emergency exits, there's one there, one there, and one over here. And also one over here too. Wait. All right, does anybody here know the difference between hemp and marijuana? What is it? Uh, hemp is an industrial product and it's the plant that, uh, oh, the fibers and everything else come from and so is marijuana. Just the THC uh, is, is yes. a big difference. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you got it. The only it difference. Now, <laughs> so both hemp and marijuana are cannabis. Um, they're, they're just two different legal classifications. So cannabis is the plant and hemp and marijuana are legal classifications for the, so they get licenses. Next one. So uh, hemp must contain less than 0.3% THC on a dry weight basis for the whole entire plant. So if you're to dry it and weigh it, you have to have less than 0.3% THC. Well, marijuana can contain more than 0.3% THC. And the reason I say that... Or, or you're getting ripped off. <laughs> yes, or you're getting ripped off. But, uh, there are some companies that produce CBD under a marijuana license. Okay. So that would technically be classified as marijuana, even though it has less than 0.3% THC, that's why I say it can have more than. Okay. Right. Next slide. All right, and as I said, the difference is the THC percent. Really straightforward. And then, is hemp legal? Yes, it is under the, uh, 2000, or the 2018 uh, Agricultural Improvement Act, which was signed into law by Trump on uh, December 20th, 20, 2018. Uh, and do you need a license to grow or process hemp? Yes, you do. You very much do need a license to grow or process hemp, which you can find on the New York State Department of Ag uh, website. And you'll find applications. For, are, they, are the CBD applications open right it's now? It's still rolling. Okay, so everything's on a rolling basis. Um, so you can kill so today's agenda. I'm gonna just give a little intro. You're gonna get a presentation from Jen, and then we'll have a QA. And then what will we learn today? So first we'll learn about what variety will you grow? What do you want to grow extract, which is CBD? Do you want to grow grain or do you want to grow fiber? And then uh, how to source quality seed and avoid scams, because there's a lot of people out there that are trying to scam people in the hemp industry uh, buying faulty seed that will not grow a good crop. Uh, how to plant and cultivate the crop. So it's pretty straightforward, but there's some things that are kind of particular to hemp that Jen will kind of get into. And the last one is what methods currently exist to harvest hemp? The reason I say what methods are to harvest hemp is because there's really no perfect method yet. And that's primarily because uh, most machinery nowadays is specified for one type of crop, right? right. Yeah. You have a corn harvester, you have a soybean harvester, you have an onion harvester, but you don't have a hemp harvester, and so stuff from like 150 years ago is probably the best stuff to use. <laughs> and uh, Jen Gilbert Jenkins is probably uh, New York's uh, top hemp scientist, and she's the assistant professor of agricultural science at SUNY Morris School. Next slide. Oh, sure. Thank you and enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So welcome for coming out on a beautiful Saturday when it's actually not raining, <laughs> right? You're indoors when yeah, right. we actually can be outdoors. Um, so I've seen some of you before, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, the basics of how to grow hemp today. I'll talk to you a little bit about where I source my seeds and the um, issues that I've run into. And we'll talk a little bit about harvesting and I feel like this is a really exciting year for harvesting. Um, this is the fourth year that I've grown hemp, and which is not very long in terms of agricultural crops, but for hemp, that's as long as we can have can grown it in New York. So uh, we're getting a little bit of experience under our belt. And for the first time, I see movement. <coughs> for the first time, um, I can't keep up with the number of changes that are happening with equipment. And so it's incredibly exciting, which makes me uh, really happy. So I'm glad to, to talk to you guys about that. I'm not allowed to go over there to touch the buttons, man. Okay. <laughs> so yes, please. So um, first, cannabis is a genus. The scientific name for hemp is cannabis sativa. There's a lot of argument over whether there are other cannabis species. 
Accepted by science right now, there is one. It is all cannabis sativa. So you'll hear about cannabis indica, and there's another one that I'm not gonna be able to think of the name of right now. Hmm? Yes, they don't actually exist. They're not really accepted. Um, cannabis sativa is the species. And uh, the only difference, as Aiden pointed out, between hemp and marijuana, those are common terms that we give to a plant that is all cannabis sativa. And when we think about the fact that uh, the Declaration of Independence was written on hemp paper and yada, 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 all these things, at that time, hemp and marijuana were the same thing. The thing that they were making the fiber out of was also the thing that they were smoking, right? It was the same plant. And it had a much lower value of THC in it at the time. In fact, even as recently as the 1960s, when we think of, of a big sort of marijuana boom at that time, um, that, uh, those varieties of marijuana really only had about maybe 6% THC in it, where now what is commonly on the market has closer to 20, 25% THC. So um, over the past 100 years, these crops have, diverse, have, have sort of divided into the almost containing no THC. So to be hemp, it has to have below 0.3%, but there are many varieties that test far below that. So really reaching detection limits for, how, for almost no THC, all the way up to the other scales, the other direction. And so it is all the same plant. Generally, it is a dioecious plant, meaning it has male plants and female plants, but most varieties have some monoecious uh, types. And if you are growing for grain, a lot of the grain varieties have been bred to have more monoecious varieties. So what does that mean? That means that the male and female are on the same plant. And why that's important for grain is because when you have a huge field and then you realize that it's dioecious, so half of the plants in your field are going to die after they release their pollen. And so they're not producing grain for you. So over time, as we have uh, moved into that grain side, right now there are more monoecious varieties. And a lot of the varieties that I grow are both dioecious and monoecious. So you'll have like 40% female and then somewhere around 30% male and 30% that are monoecious, have both male and female on the same plant. Right, so um, we are breeding to pull out these characteristics that we like the most. Um, I, my, what? The male dies, so the male produces the pollen, and then after it pollinates, it dies, and then the female flowers accept the pollen and then grow the grain. Right? So, ne next one. Um, so, we have to decide what is it that we want to grow hemp for? Do we want to grow it for grain? Do we want to grow it for fiber? Do we want to grow it for its medicinal properties? There are options to do multi-purpose. There are options to do both grain and fiber, although your quality of fiber goes down. There are options to do um, medicinal purposes like CBD and fiber, and those work really well together. There are options that um, right now Cornell is working on breeding a variety that is both grain and CBD, and that's really interesting because um, the, the cannabidiol concentration in the plant decreases after the plant's been fertilized. And so you'll hear a whole lot in the CBD world about wanting only female plants, that we need feminized seed. Because if there are any males around and those plants get fertilized, then you lose two thirds of the CBD. So you'll go from having 15% CBD to 5% CBD in the plant. Is that true? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, okay. um, and so uh, the fact that we are working on varieties that are gonna have enough CBD in it that when it gets fertilized, um, maybe it's going down to 8%, right? And so you can harvest the grain and then also, also have the flower, the leftover flower material to be able to sell. I mean, that's really exciting. So. Um, the first thing that people need to ask themselves is, what do I have the space for? What do I have the equipment for? What do I have the expertise for? And therefore, what can I grow? Right? Which of these products do I want to grow for? The um, fertility requirements differ. 
the timing of planting differs, the timing of harvest differs. And so that's really the first thing. And so what I tell all the farmers that I work with is not only is your first question, what do I want to grow for? Your first question or your part B of that question is, and who am I going to sell to? Because not a seed should go into the ground without a contract in place for where you're going to sell. And in fact, in other states, um, and I, I like to use Kentucky as an example, they, did, they went about supporting the hemp industry a little bit different. They look at us and say, oh my God, New York got funding for hemp, that's amazing. But I look at them and say, but the industry was supported there. And so what happens in Kentucky is that the companies that are processing are the ones that are being supported and they go out and recruit farmers. So there's not an acre that's being grown that doesn't have a designated place where it's being sold. And that's what we need to work on here in New York is figuring out not just what you want to grow, but who are you going to sell to. So um, if you go to the Division of Ag and Markets website and go to hemp for a while, um, the CBD side of things was closed. There were some behind the scenes logistics that made it so that that CBD license has gotten reopened up. And so not only is the grain and fiber license always rolling, and so you can apply for that at any time, but the CBD license now is. I'm not sure if it's gonna remain that way. In the past, the CBD license period was open usually from somewhere in mid-October to mid-December. Um, and then that closed and that was it because there was such a large volume of people that were interested in that. Um, in M March, they reopened the CBD applications and it's been open and rolling since then. And so they're a, a good place to go to, to check. Um, so uh, this is just on their website of what are they interested in right now? What, what do they want to see happening? And really, um, uh, the Department of Ag and Markets is licensing so that everybody who is growing and processing in New York State is protected. Um, the federal changes have just been made in December of 2018, and a lot of them are not in place yet. So there's a lot of gray area. You hear national stories about people moving hemp seed from one area to another and getting arrested in their trucks full of hemp seed or, you know, abandoned on sides of the road. And so um, the, the way that the Department of Ag and Markets is approaching this is saying, we are your partners. Right. They are not here to tell anybody that they can't do this. What they're looking for is, do you have a criminal record? Do you have a drug-related criminal record? And um, are, are you able to do what you say you want to do? If, if so, they are more than happy to take your $500 and give you a, a license, right? Which compared to the marijuana industry that I believe it's every three years their license is $10,000, 500 bucks isn't so bad, right? So um, we can move on from there. And so you, you put in your application to grow and then you become a partner with New York State, right? You are a research partner with them. And what's interesting is that that research partnership is going to go away. The reason that you had to be a research partner is because under the 2014 Farm Bill, only research into industrial hemp was allowed. As of the 2018 Farm Bill, that goes away. Industrial hemp is now allowed to be grown. It still needs to be monitored, and states still need to have a um, program for assessing where it's being grown so that we can distinguish, yes, you can grow hemp, and no, that's not marijuana. But you don't have to be doing research anymore. Anyone can grow for any reason whatsoever. But the, what, the, what the Farm Bill says is that every state has to develop the guidelines for their program. So every state was waiting for the federal government to develop their guidelines to their program and th to say this is what yours should look like. And I don't know if you can remember back to December, but uh, a couple days after this was passed, that was the, the beginning of the longest government shutdown that we've ever had. <laughs> and so people were just sitting there doing this. <laughs> like, what do we do? And so there are a bunch of pieces of the legislation that went into effect immediately. For instance, this was the easiest year for me to import my seeds that I've ever had to do. And we'll talk a whole lot more about, import, about seeds and getting them momentarily. But there were pieces of the, the legislation that weren't changing, like the fact that you still have to be a research partner until we have state programs in effect that, that say you don't. 
So for right now, these licenses say that you are a research partner with the Department of Ag and Markets, and they are incredibly supportive, but the general public needs to know and the general public needs to be aware of the fact that their um, personnel did not increase when the hemp program started. And so there are two people that are working on the hemp program there, and they are working their tails off. And um, if it takes a while for them to get back to, if they're not returning calls right away, it's not because they're not trying, it's not because the government is ignoring you, it's because there are two people, and in the open application period in December, they got 450 applications, and they are two people. <laughs> so, um, they're busy. <laughs> They're doing their best. <laughs> okay, so we can move on for that. So I, 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 that's the link to the application um, and um, the list of, uh, of growers that I, a new updated list was put out uh, last week, and so I, I can update that link. Um, and then at the end of the season, you have to submit a harvest report. Right, and uh, th you do this before you harvest, and you say, okay, I'm getting ready to harvest because they need to come out to your field and say, yes, this is industrial hemp, and they do that by taking samples and, and measuring them, right? That's part of the $500 uh, license fee is that the Department of Ag and Markets is paying for all of the chemical analysis of these plants. They're paying for the inspectors to come out to your field, take the samples, hmm? Yeah. Right, exactly. So if you divide it by the years, they're actually losing out. Uh, every test is $60. Well, depending on what they're testing for, it's between $35 and $60, depending. But it's, and so really, it, it is a, a minimal fee that they're asking folks to pay. Um, last year, only one of my fields got tested because one of my fields was a different variety than the rest of them, and they had decided that they had tested enough of the variety that I was growing. They were happy with it. It was good. It was all testing really low. Um, I was also growing a grain variety. Grain varieties don't tend to run hot. The high CBD varieties are always flirting with that 0.3% CBD. They are all going to get tested. Right, um, and so you fill out a harvest report form, and then um, I think there should be one more thing there. And then at the end of the season, you submit an annual report. You say, because these are research partnerships, you need to submit to them to say, this was the research question that I told you I was going to ask, and this is what I learned. Um, the general public is now learning that in research, we come up with lots of research questions, and we don't always get to answer the questions that we set out to answer. We often answer different questions because life happens. Um, but we do have to submit those reports at the end of the season. And so this is something that if you are thinking of growing hemp, you are taking on the fact that you're going to have to submit these reports. They're not long. They're not cumbersome. They're just, you have to do them. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, one of the things that I think is really uh, interesting is the outside push for industrial hemp growth and the misinformation that also goes along with it. So Patagonia is doing this huge, huge push for industrial hemp right now. It's amazing, it's really exciting, and they say very incorrect things. Um, I'm, I'm excited that they are, um, this is just pulled from their website. I'm really excited that they are behind the hemp movement. They are really into hemp textiles. They source all of their hemp from China. And the reason they source all of their hemp from China is because they're growing a lot of hemp for fiber that we are not doing here and they're able to process it there. But um, they also say things like, hemp can grow on marginal land and hemp doesn't need much fertility and all that is not true. So we'll, we'll, we can talk a bit more about that now. Um, so, no, that's okay. Uh, so where do you get your seed? Um, right now, there are no certified sources of seed in the United States, and that, there's an asterisk next to that. There is one company in the Midwest that is selling certified seed from Canada, but there is no U.S.-grown certified seed. It's not a big deal. It's pretty easy for us to import seeds right now. Now, Let's talk about our three uh, portions of the hemp industry. If you are growing for CBD, there is plenty of CBD seed to be had in the United States, but it's not certified. And therefore, it's a little bit like the wild, wild west. You really don't know what you're getting. In the United States, we grow hemp for CBD the same way that we grow marijuana. 
We grow it um, in raised beds under plastic where we are starting the, the, the seeds in a greenhouse and then we are transplanting them and we're growing these big Christmas tree-like things that then have to be harvested and there's a whole lot of labor in it, a whole lot of issues involved. And slowly that's changing. And the reason we're doing that is because every plant produces about one and a half pounds of dry matter per plant, of dry flower material per plant. And the varieties that we're growing have somewhere between 10 and 15% CBD. And this past year, the average price for dry flower material was $3.50 per percent CBD per pound. And if you have somewhere between 1,700 and 2,000 plants per acre, you're talking about somewhere around $40,000 an acre. As much as hops, just about. And similarly, similarly to hops, it's as much labor, okay. <laughs> right? And so it really is just tremendous. Um, this is not how the rest of the world is growing for CBD. In the rest of the world, if you go to, to European websites, their high CBD varieties have 3% CBD, not 15%. And they're planting them the way that we plant all of our field crops. And they're harvesting them with, uh, with our uh, large scale machinery. And so instead of taking a crew of 20 people 14 hours to harvest three acres, right? One person is driving in their chopper and will harvest 100 acres in a day easily, right? So, um, there's a different scale there, there's a, there, and there's going to be a price point where the uh, value of the CBD has come down enough to make it so that that is the way that we're going to grow here, and we're starting to see that happen already. Um, the difference in price also comes down to seed, where if you're buying the semini feminized seed that you're going to grow like a Christmas tree, um, you're going to pay on average a dollar a seed unless you are purchasing in large bulk, at which point you might pay 75 cents per seed. Um, when you are buying the high CBD varieties from Europe, I have one that uh, I think I have the, uh, not yet, I have the tracking, it's en route, it should be here soon. Uh, well, but in my presentation, I have a FedEx tracking of where my seed is. It should be like my, my European high CBD seed is here somewhere. It's just left Prague, um, and that had it's you know it's supposed to have three percent CBD, and that um, was seventeen dollars and fifty cents for a pound, right? So for a few thousand seeds. So it's really different when it comes to the price. Um, you're also going from planting seventeen hundred plants to two thousand plants per acre to somewhere around. Um, Oh, depending on, well, we'll get there, but either 25 pounds of seed per acre to 40 pounds of seed per acre, really when it comes to seed, you're cutting your seed cost in half, right? Which, which is significant when you're talking about a few thousand dollars. Okay, so, um, so as of now, if you are looking to grow for grain and fiber, you're sourcing from outside of the US, you're sourcing from Canada, you're sourcing from uh, Western Europe or Eastern Europe, uh, some are going to China. It's not, it, uh, it's not as common. Um, Korea also grows a lot of hemp, but they are not breeding seed right now, so that's not a place that we're sourcing seed. Did you ever run out? Did you ever try to buy it? Oh yeah, so I try to start, like if you, if you just got your license today and you tried to source seed, you'd be getting the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. um, most places are out, okay. right? The high CBD seeds have been out for a while. Um, finding people, you're in nooks and crannies right now, finding people to source high CBD seed and those are the places where you're paying a dollar a seed and they tell you it's feminized, but maybe it's not, okay. right? They t and there's no certification. So and there's a lot of scams around the high, the high CBD crop. There in um, Colorado right now, there are lots of marijuana growers that are leaving marijuana for CBD production because it's more lucrative, wow. right? And so there's a whole lot of scam around it. You need to be really careful um, and and work with folks who are not just reputable, but you have references for that you that you know. Okay, I know that this person grew with them last year, and that's. Um, a reputable source. Um, so uh, some of the companies that I've worked with 
on the next slide are um, Uni Seeds and Hemp Genetics International are two large Canadian seed companies for grain and fiber varieties. iHemp Farms and Hemp Point are both Eastern European companies that um, I love the iHemp Farms website. Um, they break down the information for every one of their seed varieties. So the iHemp Farms, and uh, this is, uh, this slide, each of those are links to their websites. Um, I, there are lots of other companies to buy from. I wanted to give you some examples of places. One of the things that I love about iHemp Farms is that if you click on a seed variety, it brings you up a data table that tells you um, the days to germination, it tells you the average seed side, it tells you the average THC and CBD content, it breaks down the average yield, the average fiber variety, the average fiber yield, is, so seed yield, fiber yield, fiber yield separated by bast and herd. I mean, they have a tremendous amount of data about all of their seed varieties. And what I love about it is that just like you can buy, um, the similar, similar varieties for multiple companies for any crop, I can then look up the information that they have for those varieties, and then if they are out of it, I can find it elsewhere. So um, they are a great source of information about the details of your seed. Um, it, it's not, but I don't mind. Yeah, I don't mind sharing my slides with Aiden, and so um, by, by all means, you can. Yeah, and so they're they're just good links to, to these. Um, I don't I don't want to sound like I am um, saying buy from these companies, right? Th these are just the companies that I have worked with. Um, there are others. I particularly like the amount of information that you can learn from iHemp Farms. They actually, I didn't get to buy from them this year. By the time that I was working with them in February, they were out of all of the varieties that I was interested in. So you need to source your seeds to to be sure that you're gonna get what you want. Um, I was working with uh, a, a bunch of these companies in November and saying, this is what I wanna grow. a year in advance, just place an order now for next year? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, no, and, it, and so um, things become difficult though, right? So this has been a ridiculous growing season already, right? We had this horrible growing season last year and we said next year is gonna be different. Yeah, it's worse. And so it's been colder, it's been wetter. And so uh, at, at SUNY Morrisville, we had bought our corn um, seed and we bought 120 day seed thinking we were gonna be able to plant by this day. Well, we went and turned that in for 100 day seed, right? Thinking we're gonna be able to plant by this day, right? Then we went and turned it in for 90 day seed, right? We had to completely change our genetics of what we are growing because of this growing season. And so that's one of the I don't want to say scary parts, but that's one of the pieces of hemp seed sourcing right now is that if all were well and perfect in the world, this is what I would want, right? But that's not the growing season that we've been having. So now we can talk a little bit about actually growing hemp. Um, Oh, I, so this was yesterday. Um, my, my, I, my shipment is supposed to be here on Thursday, but it's still stuck somewhere in Prague. And so uh, what I wanted to tell you was this is the easiest I've ever had of getting seed. So my, um, in the past three years, the seed has always sat in customs for somewhere between one and a half to three weeks, right? So they ship, it gets to the border, and it just sits, and I twiddle my thumbs and wait. And so I've been freaking out because I knew that my seed that was coming from Canada, they weren't going to have everything for me in their warehouse until May 25th. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to plant until the 15th of June. This is horrible. What's going on? Oh no, oh no. Yeah, um, I got it on Thursday. It, it was unbelievable. It took four days for, from when they shipped it to when I had it because there's no more DEA restrictions. There's no more light. There's no DEA license required anymore. So um, our uh, in January, so we had a DEA license for importing the seed, um, and in January it was going to be up. And so I was working with all the DEA agents in Syracuse and in Albany and in DC, trying to figure out like, do I need to renew my license? And um, 
we go back to a couple minutes ago, this was during the government shutdown, so no one could actually answer any questions. And it turned out they said, got back to us and said, nope, you're all good. We're done with it. We're not going anywhere near it. And so this was so smooth. We, this is a great time to be importing seed. Um, so I, I, I'm only a little bit frightened. <laughs> okay, so um, hemp is grown and harvested using traditionally available equipment, asterisk, right? So we're going to plant hemp with a grain drill. You can plant it, um, uh, no-till or conventional till, it doesn't matter. Um, there are plenty of people who will broadcast and then roll the seed instead of drilling. And that is okay if weather is perfect. Right? So if the weather is perfect and you broadcast the seed and then roll it, it'll germinate and, um, and emerge out of the soil in two to three days and all will be right and well with the world. Last year I had a farmer who did it that way for me and in the beginning of June we went into a drought and it didn't rain for the entire month of June and the seed just sat and waited and waited and waited. And well, if you've just rolled it, it's not really hidden. And so the birds came and ate a whole lot of it. And so we lost a ton in that field because of it. Um, so the research that I do with my partner farms is on nitrogen rate trials for grain production. And so they're each doing somewhere between 10 and 15 acres for me. So it's not a tremendous amount of land, but it's enough to, to be a bummer. Yeah. Um, and so that, so if weather is perfect and, and you know you're going to be able to germinate and emerge within a couple of days, great. That's absolutely fine. It'll work. If not, drilling it's the way to go. So current grain production suggestions say to treat it a bit like um, winter wheat. And what's interesting is that in Canada they've said that no, that the more nitrogen you apply, and they've applied up to 200 pounds of nitrogen, the greater the grain yield. My observations last year were you get above 150 pounds of nitrogen and you start to get lodging, just like you would get in, uh, in wheat where um, it's just too top heavy. And so I was walking through these fields and there were these huge grain heads and the plant was just half over. And um, maybe that would still be okay, but harvest becomes even more challenging. And so we're trying to uh, dial in really where are those um, sweet spots of where we're going to get a, a, enough of a grain yield and not be losing out too much because we're uh, not putting on enough nitrogen. The fiber crop is less nutrient demanding because you're not producing the grain, right? The hemp grain has a tremendous amount of protein in it. The uh, central molecule or the, the building blocks of proteins are amino acids and the central portion of amino acid is a nitrogen um, compound, and so um, you need a lot of nitrogen to pr produce high protein things. If you're not producing the grain, you don't need as much nitrogen, and so uh, we've had a lot of success with just using manure applications for our nitrogen applications without, for our, our, our uh, fiber varieties without any additional bit. Um, there is some question about where the CBD varieties fall there because you want to enhance metabolism for the CBD varieties. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about some micronutrient interactions for the CBD varieties. There is no research to support any of it. And so this year we are working with a company in uh, California that produces a a metabolism enhancer for plants and it has been shown in the marijuana industry to increase the amount of THC produced because it's increasing metabolism um, and we're going to see if, it, if it's also going to work for CBD without making the crop go hot. So we're not using the high CBD varieties to do that because they're already flirting with that 0.3%. We're going to use some um, of the European varieties, that stuff that's coming over from Prague for me, um, that's supposed to top out around 3% CBD, and we want to see if we can bump that up to 5 or 6, right, using the, this metabolite. So, so we're, we're trying to dial in the agronomy right now. We're, we're finding a lot of anecdotes. And my favorite thing to remind people is that anecdotes are not evidence, right? Because one person says, I did this and this is what I got. Therefore, X equals Y, right? That doesn't work that way. And so we're, we're trying to do some uh, replicates of strip trials and um, our, our data has been compromised the past couple of years because of the weather. 
So we're hoping that this year we're, you know, um, we could do small plot trials and in small plots come up with data. The problem with small plots is that it's really difficult to expand from a plot the size of this room to what's going to happen in a 10 acre field. Um, and so we're, we're working, but this is, this is the starting point that we start with. Crop rotation is important. So we have a lot of people entering the CBD market that are not farmers. We have a lot of people that call me constantly saying, hi, my great aunt Sally has 10 acres of land upstate and I live in the city and I want to grow CBD. And I say, go learn something, then come talk to me. Um, because like any other crop, there are pests that will uh, say, oh, hey, you're growing this year after year after year. We're going to come live here. And you're going to see that you're going to have yield that's good for one year and maybe for two years. And then for three and four and five, your yields are going to drop because your pest pressure is going to increase. And so um, it's really important to plan crop rotation. And so we have people coming from the outside of agriculture world saying, we're going to become farmers and grow hemp. And they have no idea that that means that you're going to grow more than just hemp. Right. Um, in general, uh, we're seeing a lot of benefit of hemp following alfalfa. Does, that's a really nice rotation. Um, hemp can also follow uh, cereal grains, but we don't grow a ton of oats. We don't grow a, a ton of wheat in, in New York State, and so it's a bit difficult for us to do that. Hemp shares insect pests with corn particularly the CBD hemp that we are growing because uh, the uh, European corn borer loves the thick hemp stalks. So if you're growing for fiber or grain, it's not as big a deal because your stalks are going to be about the size of my pinky or the size of my pointer finger. If you're growing for CBD in the Christmas tree style, you're producing stalks that are about yay big. And the European corn borer loves them. And so that's a really difficult crop to rotate with, um, with, so to have corn in there. Hemp shares fungal pests with both soy and wheat. And so if we were dreaming of having some sort of corn, soy, hemp rotation, it's not going to happen. Right? And so what, what seems to be working best and what seems to be what they're also uh, suggesting in um, Canada is to have hemp follow alfalfa. Okay. And um, there are no pesticides currently labeled for use with hemp. That means that the real difference between organic and non-organic hemp is did you fertilize with manure or other animal product source uh, fertilizer or are you using an inorganic fertilizer? Because you can't apply anything to either of them. That's going to change quickly with the passage of the new farm bill. Um, previously, companies were not willing to do the research to um, include hemp on their label because it wasn't legal. So no one's, they don't want it to be said on their label because it's not a legal product. They don't want to look like they are encouraging an illegal product. Right Now it's legal. And so the research has begun. It'll probably take two-ish years for that to be uh, rolling. So I would say by next year's growing season, maybe the season after, we should start seeing products that are labeled for cannabis. So um, what are the biggest pests that we see? Uh, weed pressure is huge. When we first started growing hemp, there were a lot of people that were asking questions about whether hemp was going to become the next agricultural pest. Hemp is a baby. It is the worst. It does not grow in wet soil. It won't germinate. It will kill the seed. If a weed germinates at the, and emerges at the same time as the hemp, almost all of our common field crop weeds will outcompete the hemp. All right. So um, here is a field full of mustard. And here, what's a little bit difficult for you to see right there is a Japanese beetle. In Kentucky, they've had a lot of problems with Japanese beetle. Here in New York, they hang out on the male plants and don't do much damage. Now, each year I've seen a little bit more, but I mean, you'll get a little bit of a bite here and a little bit of a bite there, but they're not defoliating. Um, you're really not seeing the pressure. And in fact, what I was seeing is that uh, in the field where this picture was taken in particular, there was a lot of pigweed in there and pigweed 
wins the battle with hemp every time. Um, and the, there were a couple of Japanese beetles that were on the male flowers, and then you look down, and there was just tons of Japanese beetle damage on the pigweed. And so it's almost like a trap crop, right? So not that I would suggest that anybody encourage pigweed in your hemp field, but it does sort of uh, pull the, the insects off of, of the hemp. So that, that on the right there is pigweed. Here on the left is one of the rushes. Um, but so in general, it is really important to know um, ragweed will all compete, goldenrod will all compete, pigweed, uh, lamb's quarter, uh, all of our common field crop weeds will, will grow as tall, if not taller than the hemp if they germinate at the same time. And so you're obviously losing yield to it. So um, using methods that are going to decrease our weed pressure is really important. So what are the things that we have the ability to do? We can grow a cover crop, right? We can grow a cover crop over the winter before and then kill the cover crop with Roundup, leave the uh, stubble there, uh, and the so you're leaving the cover there, so you're stopping your, um, you're, you're stopping your weed seeds from getting the light to be able to emerge, and then if you no-till your hemp, all is well in the world, except it's been really wet, right? So in these years where things have been really wet, that transition to no-till, this is not the crop to do it with, right? If you have a field that's been no-till for a really long time, this will work out beautifully. We tend to do a lot of minimal tillage um, in, uh, at Morrisville, and so we're, we're not truly no-till, so we still use an airway, um, and we've had a lot of success with, with hemp that way. But um, managing your weed pressure, and so managing the timing of application and the timing of, of field preparation is absolutely key. So a lot of the fungal pests are attacking our uh, stalks as well as the plants. We have fusarium, we have pythium. They are, are common fungal pests for things like soybeans, you know, the white mold. And so th these are the, the um, problems that we're seeing out in the field. We're not seeing enough to really uh, impact yield loss yet, but again, this is year four. Uh, and so with only three growing seasons uh, uh, behind us, we expect pest pressure to increase as well, right? With that 2018 Farm Bill, we sort of have talked about this a little bit. We can now automatically go across state lines, except that's being challenged and folks aren't, right? So if this state doesn't have a hemp program yet and that state does in the past, it's been a gray area of whether or not you can drive through it with the 2018 Farm Bill. It said, no, it's totally legal. Interstate commerce is fine and yet uh, folks are still running into trouble that way. So there's still a bit of gray areas, but um, there shouldn't be, right? Everything should be legal now. Okay, so what are some of the things that we need to, to know about? We haven't been growing hemp for a very long time, which means that we haven't been breeding hemp for a very long time. Um, one of the things that stands out most to me is that when you drive by a cornfield, right? You have an even crop across the field. When you drive by a soybean field, you have an even crop across the field. When you drive by a hemp field, it looks like rolling hills because we have not been doing the uh, 70 years of breeding that corn and soybean have got. And so um, there's still enough variability within the genetic code to make it so that uh, you are seeing variability in the field. There's also, uh, we haven't bred for the best traits that are necessary. So uh, um, in the illicit world, right, uh, the, the cannabis sativa has been bred for the past 100 years to increase THC content, and man, have we been good at doing that, right? But when it comes to agricultural production, we haven't bred for winter harving, hardiness, we ha although it is pretty hardy. We haven't bred for... Um, uh, moisture hardiness. And so the hemp will show you where every weak spot in your field is, particularly where every wet spot in your field is, like no other crop. If there is one, one small area that is just slightly wetter than all the areas around it, you'll see that the hemp there is two feet short, shorter, right? And so um, we don't have the genetics to produce the strong crop that we see uh, in our other field crops. And so there's a lot of stand variability. And so that leads to difficulties in harvesting, right? 
you, you don't see uh, a combine going through a soybean field, raising and lowering the cutter head, right? You set it and you go. With hemp, you're, tr you're constantly trying to decide, do I need to raise up? Do I need to put down? Where am I in cutting here? And so um, th it, it is a, a real tricky spot that we're in right now. It will get better, but right now that's where we are. Uh, and so that leads to yield variability. You can see here, this is a really small seed and this is a really large seed. So seed size becomes important if you're farming for grain because once you've combined the seed, you need to clean it. And grain is clean based on mesh size, screen mesh size, right? And so if you have a wide range of seed size, then you don't have a consistent mesh size for, uh, for cleaning it and, and you end up with either losing some or with grain that isn't quite clean enough. And so it really is uh, tricky. In fact, so the, one of the varieties that I'm growing this year um, it is supposed to have a larger seed size and a more consistent seed size. It's why I chose this variety was for what, they, what their claims are about the grain so that we should be able to harvest a bit more easily. Um, these are also uh, four plants from the same field and that had all received the same amount of fertility. This is uh, from two years ago. And you see the difference in the seed head length. And so the amount of grain being produced, it can be variable. And so we're working on uh, th that variability with because it, it was all the same variety, could have been because of spot differences in um, nutrient content within the field. These weren't from specific nitrogen rate trials. These were just from um, one big field that had received manure applications. And so there could have been um, fertility variability that needed to be dialed in, but still all the same variety and you're going from the difference of a three foot grain head to a one foot grain head. And um, that's gonna impact not only the amount of grain that you're harvesting obviously, but where are you gonna cut? Because when you're harvesting your hemp, you wanna take into, particularly for grain, you wanna take into the combine the least amount of fiber that you possibly can because the fiber is what screws us all up. Okay, so. We'll talk about harvesting in a second, right? And here's a difference in, um, in the thickness of your stalk size so that there were some stalks in that field that were the size of my pinky and some that were the size of my thumb. Does that variability matter if you're harvesting for grain? No, if you're harvesting for fiber, absolutely. Because the differences in your stalk um, thicknesses change the amount of the fiber that's there. So the hemp stalk has two types of fiber and it has bast fiber, that's what we make textiles out of, and it has herd fiber, that's the absorbent woody material that's kind of like balsa wood. If you are growing for, for fiber and you wanna to sell to somebody who um, is uh, gonna produce hempcrete, then you're selling them your herd. And so you want as much herd as possible, so you want thicker stalks. If you are growing for somebody who is going to um, reinforce plastics, then they want the bast fiber. And so that bast fiber is on the outside, and so you want the thinnest stalks that you can get because surface area is what you're looking for. So what you are growing for determines how you plant. If you are looking for very thin stalks that are, that, so you're going for the bast fibers, then what you wanna do is plant at a higher rate. You plant somewhere around 45 pounds of seed to the acre because you want, those seed, you want those plants to be competing with each other. So they're spending all of their energy growing up. If you wanna grow for the herd, then, and you're growing for fiber, then you're more concerned with uh, a thicker stalk. And so you don't want them competing as much. You want that stalk to be able to bulk up more. And so you'll plant at closer to your grain rate, which is uh, about 25 pounds of pure live seed per acre. Some of the recommendations coming out of Canada are for even lower, for somewhere between 18 and 20 pounds of pure live seed per acre. Um, that depends on the variety. So hemp doesn't like poorly drained soil. I think the next uh, picture is a perfect example of this. So that picture on your right, that's all one field. It was all planted at the same time. And you see a really distinct line through the field where what's closest to us is just soil. And what's behind that, you see green plants growing. And the only difference is wet, dry, right? Hemp does not like wet. <laughs> Um, hemp is a plant that is triggered to go into its 
uh, flowering stage to go from the vegetative stage to the reproductive stage uh, based on the hours of darkness. Except stress can also trigger that. And so the year, this is two years ago on, on the right here, um, we saw plants that were about six inches tall flowering, right? And at first we thought, is it because it's been so rainy and gray and it's because they're thinking it's hours of darkness? But really it looks like that water stress, they were like, let's just reproduce because we're not going to live through this one, right? So the, the, these are the, the, the things that are tricky for us that we want to make sure that they don't go into the reproductive stage before we're ready for them to. All right, and then uh, here also it is on the left is a field that is uh, being checked for the uh, emergence of um, weeds. So we, we uh, check all of our fields every other week and we measure the height of the average height of uh, the hemp as compared to the average height of the uh, weed species that are around it. We look at the variety that are of weed species that are there. Um, and if you see anything that is uh, remotely as tall as your hemp um, when it is first coming out, then, then you've lost the battle already. Um, if the hemp gets to be about knee high, then the growth rate is so fast that it can shade out what's around it and it does a great job of preventing its own weeds. And that's why uh, planting time is so important. Okay. Right, um, so I think I've said that a bunch of times. <laughs> right, so here are some examples of, of some of the pests. So this is what, what uh, the fusarium can do, can do to your crop. It looks really pretty, it's sort of neat. You look and the, the leaves turn these like tie-dye green and yellow, like bright yellow, but you don't actually want to see that. So, I, it's, and, and what it also does is um, that comparison on the right is a healthy small root system to a fusarium uh, infected root system. And so that's really where the trouble is coming. So this is one field. Uh, my, my students have to work in the hemp fields all the time and they get a little bit grumpy about it. Um, and we can see this field has some really wet spots and some really dry spots and some not so well fertilized spots. and. Um, you know, for these students here, it's barely coming up to their waist, whereas those students on the right, it's about um, shoulder height, and that's this thing. Like, I, I was pointing my camera this way, and then I turned and pointed it this way. So this is at the same moment in the same field. Okay, it's a little unfair that the kid on the far right there makes it look like it's a lot shorter than it actually is. He's 6'9", but... <laughs> Okay, so um, we, I, I, I don't really know how to say this other than there are still bugs to work out with the harvest, and that's a bit of an understatement, but um, the rate of technology transfer right now is tremendous, and every month there are more people coming out with more products. There are more of our large-scale industries saying, hey, we want to get involved. I've been working um, up by us with CAS equipment, with Empire Tractor, with uh, Clinton Tractor, with all of the major equipment dealers in our region, uh, and they're all excited. They see that people, at first, they were a little bit standoffish. They're like, this is going to be just a fad. No one's actually going to grow it. It's not a real agricultural crop. And now they're like, hey, no, we want to get on board. We see that people are actually going to grow this, and, and we want to be part of this. We want you to be able to get your equipment from us. They're like, oh, wait, you can buy things. So. Um, as there are more farmers interested, more true equipment is coming on hand and less, as my husband's family would say, yakka foot stuff, where you're just taking, you know, some duct tape and some wood and putting something together to fix a, a, a problem. The, there are a couple of main problems. One is that the hemp fiber has a tendency to wrap. And so you need to make sure that when you are driving through your field, there is nothing for the, the fiber to wrap on. For instance, last year we, um, we cut our fiber crop down with a sickle bar mower that worked mostly lovely. -y. There were was, there was some issues with that, but it worked pretty well. And then we let it ret in the field. So it started to decompose in the field, which is really important because it's going to return a lot of the potassium to the soil. So I didn't talk about the potassium requirements of hemp. The potassium requirements are almost exactly the same as the nitrogen requirements. It takes a tremendous amount of potassium. And so if you let it decompose in the field a bit, you're returning some of that potassium right away because it's the first nutrient to be returned. 
Potassium isn't incorporated into any organic molecules. It stays as a potassium ion in living things. And so when all living things die, as soon as the uh, cellular materials are oozed out, right, the potassium is returned. It's a pretty quick rate of return. And so letting the plant ret in the field a little bit is ensuring that you're not going to end up with a potassium deficiency. Um, so we came through with a rotary rake once a week for uh, three weeks and just turned it to make sure we're getting even redding. And then we uh, baled it with a round baler. Well, the baler was set up for traditional hay, and so there were a lot of tubes of wires that were sort of hanging down. Well, as you're driving through the field, hemp was getting wrapped on them and just ripped stuff out and did a few thousand dollars worth of damage. And so you know, we went to Clinton Tractor and we said, okay, first let's fix this and two, let's plan better for next year. And they were on board. They said, great, th th this is all we need to do. We need to say, oh, this is where it was catching. So we need to make sure that this is protected. So harvest equipment, we, we can use a combine. We just may need to make sure that the things that have to be protected are protected. Commonly right now, what's protecting rolling and moving pieces are PVC pipes that are being cut in half and put over rollers. I am an agronomist. I am a soil chemist by trade. I am not an engineer. I like to look at these things and I say, that's really neat. I can't design them. Um, the, the, with our combines, some of the problem that's happening is um, that we need the types of combines that are more like a conveyor belt and less spinning wheels so that we are moving the hemp materials into the combine. We have to be careful with harvesting hemp for grain because it's an indeterminate plant, just like a lot of our uh, tomato plants are, right? So you're going to have some portions of the plant that are ripe and ready for harvest while there are new portions elsewhere, right? And so when that happens, it means we have to look at our crop and say, when's it time to harvest our grain? Because the grain doesn't hang on. And so you get a big windstorm, you get a big rainstorm, and you were ready to harvest, your harvest is now on the ground. So in one of our fields last year, um, because of the rain, because of the wind, because of the ridiculous fall weather, um, we harvested in the middle of October instead of in the middle of September. And what was a field that, that, should, that I was estimating based on our measurements should have been giving me somewhere around 800 pounds of grain to the acre was giving me 80. Wow. So you have a harvest window. <clears throat> Right. You don't have a harvest mile. And so um, it's really important to be able to make that call between there's some of the grain here that's still green and not ready, but if I wait too long, I'm going to lose all here that's hanging on there. So we have to look at the weather. We have to look at the plant development. It's tricky. Personally, my favorite hemp crop is the fiber crop. My favorite hemp crop is a fiber crop for two reasons. One, because I see incredible potential in the fiber crop. I see that in, it's going to take five to 10 years for the fiber industry to really grow so, to the point where we can have lots of people involved. But it is the crop that fits our um, time frame, right? So you plant it now. It grows, it grows, it grows. It starts to go into its reproductive phase somewhere around the last week of July. And that's where we're gonna come through and harvest because if the fiber crop gets pollinated, the, the, the fiber material degrades. And so you get a coarser fiber instead of a smoother fiber. And so if we're looking at those high quality textile and other high quality fiber uses, you really need to harvest it right around the time when it, it is um, going into the reproductive stage. And so that means that you've now cut it somewhere around the last week of July or first week of August. And then we're going to let it ret in the field, right? So then um, we're going to bale it somewhere around the third to fourth week of August. You now have a month of growing. You now have the ability to cover crop with whatever you want to cover crop with. And so um, it, it, from a soil health perspective, because that's something that's really important to me, um, I think the fiber crop works just, it is the perfect crop if we're going to choose one for, uh, from the hemp industry for New York State. It gives us the most options for good farming and for good uh, cover cropping and, and, and soil management. But what's everybody growing in New York right now? They're growing CBD hemp. About 75% of all of the hemp licenses right now are for CBD because that's where the money is. Will it stay that way? I don't think so. But um, 
or at least I hope not, because I'm really excited about fiber hemp. But, uh, but you know, everyone has to get on board. And there are some really interesting things about, um, about harvesting for fiber and for grain and for CBD, because every month there are new companies that are coming on board. There, there's a, a company, Bish, and their partner is Hemp Harvest Works, and um, they have brought some new large-scale equipment onto the market for harvesting CBD hemp. Um, John Deere is working really hard on uh, co grain combines. They produce them in Canada. They're, they have not brought them into the United States yet, but they are working on it. Um, it, it is right on the forefront of their mind now because they see more people are doing it. And so this harvest is, um, it's the hardest part right now, but it's also the part that's changing the most quickly. Right, so at, at, at every, every week I'm learning of new companies that are getting on board and new people who are trying new things. And, and the past four years have not been like this. Th this is really exciting for the, the technology that is um, the rate of transfer from the, for a harvest. Um, and so there are a couple of things that we need to think about when it comes to, to, to harvest, right? Um, do we want to rent in the field or not for our fiber? And that's gonna, going to completely depend on who you are selling your fiber to and what kind of equipment they have. Do they need to decorticate unredded fiber or do they need to decorticate redded fiber? That's gonna, that comes back to the conversations that growers need to have with processors, right? With our grain, we need to look at our timing and we need to look at access to drying. So the grain um, is uh, an incredibly high protein grain. It also has a lot of oil in it, right? So we can press the grain for, for oil, which is a del you know, delicious salad oil. It's used in cosmetics, blah, blah, blah. But it has a really high omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acid profile, and that makes it spoil quickly quicker than most other grains. So from harvest, the time it needs to be dried down, you need to get it into the dryer in four hours, right? If you don't get it into a dryer in four hours, it's starting to rot. You will put your hand in it and it will be hot. And so um, you really need to think about that access to drying. Then um, for CBD, you need to think about what do you want to spend your money on? Do you want to spend it on equipment that you can use year after year, or do you want to spend it on labor um, to be doing everything by hand? And then what's your access to drying? Because once you are harvesting the CBD flowers, you need to, to dry that plant material as well. And so um, that, that is a space consideration that people don't always think about. Okay, so these are some of the things that you need to think about when you're, when you're planning out, well, which one of these crops am I going to grow and how do I need to approach them? Okay, um, and, and uh, oh, who, who is your buyer and what do they require should be first on the list because before the seed goes in the ground, you need to know where it's being sold to and what they need you to do to produce the crop that they want most. Great. Well, right. thank, thank you, you very so much. much. My, my pleasure.